a reminder, if you haven't followed me on all my social links, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all those places, podcasts, the links are all in the description below. And uh, let's get the word of God out there ready to go so people can get the most out of it. So join this journey through the book of Matthew. And we are starting today in verse 1. We're going to look at the first half of Matthew chapter 3 today, verses 1 to 6. And uh, this is the introduction to one of the most unique, you could say unusual characters in the Bible, John the Baptist. And uh, it starts off uh, with uh, uh, an, an introduction into John the Baptist coming preaching in the wilderness of Judea in, in, in verse 1 of chapter 3. Now you have to remember this is about a 25, 26 year gap from the end of chapter 2 to the beginning of chapter 3. And uh, we, we know a little bit about some parts of that uh, in other Gospels, but in the book of Matthew, it goes straight into pretty much the beginning of the ministry phase of Jesus' life. So John the Baptist comes preaching in the wilderness of Judea. This is John the Baptist, kind of had a little bit of a, you know, an Isaac experience where he was born to old parents who really shouldn't have had kids uh, or been old enough to have kids, Zacharias and Elizabeth. And uh, John the Baptist was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and what that means. And he was preaching in the wilderness and he was preaching, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John's message was a, a message of a call to repentance. Uh, some people think uh, that repentance is just about what you feel. Uh, as, you know, feeling, I feel sorry that I sin, you know, and it's good to feel sorry for your sin, but repentance is actually not a feelings word. It's an action word. It's what do you do once you feel sorry? And John told his listeners that what they needed to do was they had to change how they thought, uh, not just merely feel sorry for what they've done. They had to change how they would act from now on. And so repentance is about a change of direction, not just a, a feeling of sorrow. David Guzik said this, is repentance something we must do? before we can come to God? Yes and no. Repentance does not describe something we must do before we come to God. It describes what coming to God is like. If you are in New York and I tell you to come to Los Angeles, I don't really need to say, leave New York and come to Los Angeles. To come to Los Angeles is to leave New York. And if I haven't left New York, I certainly haven't come to Los Angeles. We can't come to the kingdom of heaven unless we leave our sin and the self life. Now, the call to repentance is important and it's something we can never neglect. And uh, it really is the very first word. The word repent is the first word of the gospel message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. Repent was the first word of John the Baptist's gospel in, in here in Matthew chapter 3. Repent was the first word of Jesus' gospel in Matthew chapter 4 and Mark chapter 1. Repent was the first word in the preaching ministry of the 12 disciples in Mark chapter 6. Repent was the first word in the preaching instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples after he was resurrected in Luke chapter 24. Repent was the first word uh, of the exhortation for the Christian uh, in the first Christian sermon in Acts chapter 2, um, the establishment of the church. Repent was the first word in the mouth of the Apostle Paul uh, in his uh, ministry in Acts chapter 26. So repent can accu accurately be described as the first word of the gospel. Now, John was preaching in the wilderness. Now, if you haven't been to Israel, it's very hard to comprehend what wilderness means. Once you've been there, you understand what it means because it's not desert. Uh, it's kind of like a hot, arid, dry place where there are, there are some greenery, and, uh, you know, but, but not a lot. And uh, there's the River Jordan that runs through it. And it, it's, it's, it really is, as the name suggests, a wilderness, kind of like you would imagine in a movie set. That's what it's like when you go to Israel. And that's where uh, Carson says this, it's hot and apart from the Jordan itself, it's arid and not, and though it's not unpopulated. And that's the, 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 the wonderful thing about the wilderness in Israel is that people live there and have been living there for millennia. Uh, now, what did John say? He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John wanted to know that people to know that the kingdom of heaven was near and it was as close as their hand, at hand. Uh, and it wasn't something that was a long way away or something to dream about or something to imagine. And that's why John had an urgency to his call for repentance. Because if the kingdom of heaven is as close as your hand, then you better get ready for it now. John's message wasn't, hey, 
uh, you're a sinner, therefore you need to repent. His message was, Messiah the King is coming and his kingdom is coming. And so the only way for you to enter that kingdom is to repent. Uh, and and that you have to respond to that news that the kingdom is coming. Uh, now, Matthew used the term the kingdom of heaven instead of the term kingdom of God, uh, mainly to avoid offense in Jewish readers because they... they Jewish people, even to this day, don't like even writing the word God. You'll see them write G underscore D. Uh, and uh, that's just a reverence and respect thing. And they didn't like having direct references to God. Uh, so they would refer to where God dwelt, which is heaven, uh, instead of God himself. So for to, to be received by Jewish people to whom Matthew was writing this, it was uh, more appropriate and easier for him to say the kingdom of heaven rather than the, the kingdom of God. Adam Clark uh, gives a further idea. Why is it called the kingdom of heaven? Because God designed that his kingdom of grace here should resemble the kingdom of glory above. Hence, our Lord teaches us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, verse 3. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Uh, yeah, so it gives you a great picture of John. Uh, Matthew quotes this, this scripture from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, to identify John the Baptist as the one who was the prophesied forerunner of Jesus, the Messiah. And, and to fulfill this role, John's purpose was to prepare people's hearts for the Messiah and to bring an awareness of sin to the people of Israel so that they could receive salvation that was going to be offered uh, you know, from sin by this Messiah who is going to come. Uh, D.A. Carson said this, according to John 1.23, the Baptist John once applied this passage to himself. Here, Matthew does it for him. Just a reference to him saying, I, I'm here to prepare a way for the Messiah. Now, he said that when he was quoting from Isaiah here, Isaiah chapter 40, that part of his role was to uh, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. So, this is a passage that's quoted directly from verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 40, and it has, has in mind the building of, of a road for this majestic king to travel on, and so he's preparing the way, he's making sure this road is appropriate. And the idea is uh, taken, Adam Clark says this, the idea is taken from the practice of Eastern monarchs who, whenever they entered upon an expedition or took a journey through a desert country, sent harbingers, which is somebody who is sent to ahead to provide lodging, before them to prepare all things for their passage and pioneers to open the passes, to level the ways and to remove all impediments. That's what John the Baptist, that's what he, his role was. And the idea of preparing the way of the Lord really is a word picture for us to understand what it looks like because the real preparation doesn't take place physically, it takes place in our hearts. And uh, building a road physically is very much what God has to do, uh, the preparation work in our hearts. We have to build a road in order to get to God and that's what Jesus does. Now, um, those roads in our heart are no different than trying to build a road in the, in the wilderness. It's not easy. It's not easy to connect our hearts to the necessity of salvation through the admission of sin and repentance. Uh, but that's, what, that's what's required. And that's what John the Baptist was there to really just call people to repentance. See, Jesus was this coming Messiah and King and John the Baptist was the one crying in the wilderness. Um, now you can imagine for him, that must have been something that came out of a spirit of and, and a heart of desperation for people to, under, to want to accept and understand this message. And I think we sometimes fail to appreciate how important the preparing work of the Lord is because any, any work that God's going to do that's going to be great is going to start with a lot of preparation. And that's no different in the lives that you and I live. Uh, if God's going to do something great in our lives, he has to do a work of preparation first. Spurgeon said this, Men's hearts were like a wilderness, wherein there is no way. But as loyal subjects throw up roads for the approach of beloved princes, 
so were men to welcome the Lord with their hearts made right and ready to receive him. Now, John the Baptist had some interesting clothing and dietary uh, things going on here. Uh, he was clothed with camel's hair. Uh, and if you've ever been close to a camel or felt the camel, you know not exactly the most comfortable kind of hair. Uh, very practical for the wilderness, however. And uh, in, in John's personality and his ministry, uh, he was in a way patterned after Elijah, uh, 2 Kings chapter 1, you can read about that, who, who fearlessly called Israel to repentance. Uh, D.A. Carson says this, both Elijah and John had very stern ministries in which austere garb and clothing and diet confirmed their message and condemned the idolatry of physical and spiritual softness. Now, it wasn't that John the Baptist was trying to be like Elijah. Um, or, or, which was predicted in Malachi chapter 4, as if he decided to, you know, uh, create some brand, if you like, of, oh, well, I guess if I'm going to be like this Elijah-like character, I'd need to have a brand that's, you know, I'm using that word in our context. Now, John knew the words that were spoken to his father, Zacharias, before he was even born, and you can read that in Luke chapter 1. Uh, he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's just who John the Baptist was. He, he, he embraced who he was. He didn't try to be somebody else. And, uh, and, and he was like that before he was even created in his mother's womb. That was his identity. France, RT France, his diet, though limited, was nutritious and readily available in the wilderness. Uh, locusts and wild honey. Now, the honey that he ate was probably date honey, not bee honey. Uh, and again, when you go to Israel, that's just we explain to you why uh, date honey was uh, the, the honey that was most often referred to in the Bible. And there are date palms all through the wilderness. So it's not hard to find date honey. Uh, Spurgeon said this, Lord, let not my meat, my drink, or my garments hinder me in thy work. And that's what John the Baptist was. He's like, look, I've got clothes and I've got food. That's all I need. I have the basics and I've got to get the message out there of repentance. Verse five. Um, then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, John the Baptist, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. John's ministry met with this overwhelmingly, incredibly positive response. There were all these people who recognized their sinfulness and their need to get ready for the Messiah, and they really were willing to do something about it. And because of God's blessing on John's ministry, his message of repentance, his call to prepare for the way of the Lord, actually bore a lot of great fruit because he was doing what God called him to do. And that's the same for you and for me. When we do what God's calling us to do, we produce fruit. And sometimes when we're not producing fruit, it's because we're not doing what God wants us to do. Now, that's not always the case because sometimes there's a, a season gap. Uh, there's a timing gap between when we do what God's called us to do and the season later that we see the fruit produced. But if you are doing the same thing for many seasons in a row and you're not seeing any fruit, maybe you're not doing what God wants you or has called you to do. Maybe you're doing what you want to do. Uh, William Barclay says, baptism was for sinners and no Jew ever conceived of himself as a sinner shut out from God. Now for the first time in their national history, the Jews realized their own sin and their own claimant need of God. Never before had there been such a unique national movement of penitence and a, a search for God. RT France. John's preaching created a widespread revival movement and his followers constituted a significant group within Judaism, which maintained its separate existence beyond the New Testament period. Now, Josephus was a Jewish historian who actually died in 100 AD. He was pretty much alive for the whole time of John's ministry and, and uh, um, would have been around for watching the, you know, the disciples, and he documented a lot of things that happened. He actually wrote a lot more about John the Baptist than he did about Jesus. The, the influence of John the Baptist at that time in history was enormous, even though his ministry was only for a very short period of time. 
decades later, people were still talking about what he had done. You can read about that in Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 19, about the influence of John's ministry many years after uh, uh, John came to a, a, a tragic uh, end of his life. Now, with baptism, John offered something that was a ceremonial washing that confessed sin and actually did something to demonstrate repentance. And Matthew 5.3, uh, you know, which we're going to look at in another chapter, says that be before we can gain the kingdom of heaven, we must recognize our poverty of our spirit. Uh, and, and this type of awareness of sin, it, it's really the foundation for the revival that John the Baptist saw, but it's also been the foundation for every revival ever since. And baptism means to, to uh, immerse, uh, overwhelm, to drench. John just didn't sprinkle water on people when, he was baptized, when they were baptized. Uh, the custom of other Jewish ceremonial washings, John fully immersed those people who were baptized. Now, baptism was already practiced in the Jewish community, uh, but it was typically among Gentiles who wanted to become Jews. Uh, for a Jew in John's day to submit to you know, baptism by immersion was essentially to say, I confess that I'm as far away from God as a Gentile is and that I need to get right with God. Well, that was the real work of the Holy Spirit that was working through John the Baptist. John's baptism was very unique. It was so unique that he became known as the baptizer. If, if, if there was nobody else doing it, then he wouldn't have been called the baptizer. Uh, Christian baptism is like John's in the sense that what it does is it demonstrates repentance. But it's also more because the, the people who were baptized by John the Baptist before Jesus' death had a different baptism experience than those baptized after Jesus' death and resurrection. And we're going to talk about that as we get into the second half of chapter 3. But if you want to read about what identification is with Christ through baptism and you want to hear what that is, just watch my uh, video on Romans chapter 6. If you watch that, I go through all of the identification process, the requirement for adult baptism in the Bible and what it means for us. Nothing wrong with people being baptized as babies and children. That's great. It's great that parents introduce their children to, to a, a life with God and, and a life raised in the ways of the Lord. But Jesus, remember, was baptized as an adult. And we believe in ab adult baptism, that when you are old enough to make a decision for yourself, you make a public declaration of your faith, not your parents' faith, not because somebody else did it for you, your faith, your identification with Christ as a Christ follower. And you say, yeah, I, I want to identify with Christ because Jesus said, repent and be baptized. And that's what John the Baptist was doing. Now, there was something really miraculous about Jewish people at this time submitting to John the Baptist to be baptized because they were very serious about getting right with God. Uh, F.F. F. Bruce said this, this confession of sins by individuals was a new thing in Israel. There was a collective confession on the great day of atonement, an individual confession in certain specified cases. But no, that's in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 5, for example. But no great spontaneous self-unburdenment of penitent souls every man apart. It must have been a stirring sight to watch John the Baptist baptize Jewish people. Spurgeon said this, the confessing their sins, which went with baptism in the Jordan, gave it its meaning. Apart from the acknowledgement of guilt, it would have been a mere bathing of the person without any spiritual significance. Now, I love, as a pastor, being involved in people being water baptized. I remember when I was water baptized as, young, as a young man by my father uh, in a pool in the suburb of Sydney as a young man. And I have baptized uh, hundreds of people. I, I don't even know, maybe thousands, I don't know. It's a lot. A lot. Uh, and it's one of my greatest joys is to baptize people. And I've, I've had the chance to baptize people all around the world in all different places. Baptize people in different countries. In, in the freezing Baltic Ocean, the Baltic Sea uh, in, in, in Russia. Uh, I've baptized people in the River Jordan where Jesus was baptized in Israel. I've baptized people in lakes in Minnesota. Uh, I've baptized people in hot tubs at church picnics. And it doesn't matter where 
I have baptized people. It has always amazed me the spontaneous feeling of identification with Jesus Christ. Some of the most amazing times that I've had uh, baptizing people where there's been an understanding that they are a new creation in Christ has been some of the, the orphans in Russia that we have met and, uh, and had, had opportunity to, to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ and for them to accept his free gift of salvation, to go through the waters of baptism and then have them tell me stories afterwards about how they, their eyes were open to now that there's a purpose in life, they understand that, that God was not there to just judge them and tell them they were bad like everybody else, but to tell them they were good and that they had a purpose in life and that there was an eternity that, that lay awake for them. Uh, those moments have just been incredible and moving for me. And I just want to encourage you, if you are an adult Christian and you've not been water baptized, then uh, you need to do it. I'm not encouraging you to do it. I'm telling you to do it. Uh, it doesn't secure your salvation, but it's just pure obedience. Jesus said, repent and be baptized. That means if you haven't been baptized, then you're just being disobedient. And there's no reason you could tell me why you shouldn't have to do it, because there's nothing bad that's going to happen to you. Do you think the devil's going to tell you to, yes, go ahead and, and, and be baptized in that? That's a bad thing to publicly identify with Jesus Christ. No, he's not going to do that. He wants to tell you not to do it. He wants to tell you to not identify publicly with Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't done it, then just challenge yourself and do it the next time it's available at your church. Uh, maybe ask your pastor uh, if he can come and do it, or maybe it's on a, a vacation. No, I, don't, I don't care where it is. Just do it in public and allow God to work through that experience for you. Maybe type in the description below in the comments what your baptism experience was like. Where did you get baptized? What was it like? What happened to you? What do you, what do you remember? Some of you have been baptized in different countries. You know, I've baptized people, the same person in three or four different countries. Uh, why? Uh, that, 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 that first time is an identification with Christ that, that represents something that's special. But then to do it in other countries is just a matter of saying, God, I'm just being a public witness in this country of my identification with Jesus Christ by going down in the water and coming up again. That's the opportunity that we have. So maybe share some of your stories. I think we'd all love to hear them. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you sent people like John the Baptist, who even for a very short period of time had an amazing ministry of impact on our lives. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would just be obedient. If you, God, tell us to repent and be baptized, I pray, Lord, that we just repent and be baptized and we would understand the power that comes with identification, with obedience to what you ask us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.